שלום חברים, I would like to welcome all our Maccabi חברים from around the world and our participants from Latin America taking part in our leadership programs to Israel. I'd like also to greet our special guest, Brauch Shuv, chairman of the Partisans Organization, his two sons, Roni and Yossi. And by the way, Yossi was, Roni was the one to lead the longest journey of El Al ever from Tel Aviv to Melbourne to rescue the Israelis who got stuck in Australia and bring them back to Israel. Both are Air Force fly, fighters uh, uh, pilots. I'd like to welcome also Dr. Margalit Gano and Iris Klieger. Both will give us their testimonies. Later on, General, General in Reserve, Idone Khushtan, former commander of the Israeli Air Force, will join us. It is important for us to gather as the Maccabi family and to commemorate the six million Jews that perish in the Holocaust. Thank you all for your participation and I would like to ask you to prepare your candles for the lightning of candles later on. And now I'm pleased to invite Amir Pellet, Chairman Maccabi World Union for the opening remarks. Amir, bevakasha. Hello, Haverim. It's going to be a short. I'm very, very excited to be here in this special day. Special day for Jewish people, special day in a challenging area the entire world is uh, living in uh, under the attack of the corona and to wish all of us to pass it healthy, strong and come back to normal life. Uh, in Israel, and uh, soon we'll hear from uh, Baruch Borka Shuv, the heads of the partisans. In Israel, there are about 189,000 survivors from the Holocaust. The average age of them is 84. So we can estimate, we wish them a many, many years to go, but we can estimate and understand that we take this memory uh, from quite soon on upon ourselves and we'll never forget it. Uh, if I'm going back for one second to the history of the movement connected to the Holocaust, we are talking about uh, about 100,000 uh, Maccabi athletes before the war, before the Holocaust, in 12 countries in Europe, in thousands of uh, uh, clubs, uh, having different kinds of sports. And it was a kind of growing up organization started by the beginning of the century. And as I say, before the war, we had about 100,000. During the war, all the Maccabi class, uh, clubs were demolished, no more. And uh, by the end of it, thousands and thousands of our Maccabi friends were killed in the Holocaust. What happened from then on until those days preparing the new Maccabiya is the kind of uh, the torch uh, we are leading as the Maccabi family. And all of us are very proud to be part of it. I am very, very proud to head the organization and to see you all guys from 10 tense countries around the globe. Those who are going to sleep uh, soon in Australia and those who just woke up in Latin America and in America. What I want to do is to open with, I would say, two uh, parts of a song, the partisan songs, those who fighted uh, 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 the Nazis, uh, the, those Jewish guys that Borka, Baruch Shuv, was the head of them. I will open and ask uh, Yossi Shuv, Borka's son, to continue in where the Tirol. Many of you will not understand the roads, but you have to understand that's a kind of an answer of the partisans. So I will be the one to start. Those who know the song, you can do it by mute, but you see, we will see you are trying to sing it. 
אל נא תאמר הנה דרכי באחרונה, את בוא היום הסתירו צמי העננה, ביום נחשפנו לו יד You hear me? Everyone here? Yes. So, hi. The name is here, it's written down here, Amit, but this is the third generation. I'm the second generation. My name is Yossi. And on behalf of the next generation of the Holocaust and the heroism legacy, I wrote another a verse of the song, of this partisan song, sing now, when light of hope scattered the clouds, you partisans can be proud of your second generation as we took over now. And it goes like this. You never heard the words because I wrote them, but it's like a, a, a theme for us. So I'll try and do it. עוד אמרתם את המילה האחרונה, כי אור תקווה פיזר את שמי העננה. לא ההמשך לזיכרון היום הושבע, זה יום נחשפתם לו והנה הוא כבר בא. כן, פרטיזנים, תשמחו על זה הדור. היו גאים כי הם למדו מרחב ודרור. זה צו מורשת ותקומה אנו נזכור. שבזכותכם נדע שלום תקווה ואור. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. Thank you, Yossi. רק שנייה, אייל. Of course, I want to welcome the president of the movement, ג'קי, היי, ג'קי טרפינס. And uh, I see here one of the world Olympics, uh, uh, the Israelis, אריק זאבי. a medalist, I see Tal Brody, and I see many, many of you. I don't mention you. I love you all. Thank you very much, Eyal. Thank you, Amir. Thank you, Yossi. Uh, Mr. Baruch Shul was the head of the Partisans organi- Organization in Lithuania and Belarus. He formed a group of Jewish freedom fighters to combat the murderous Nazis. Baruch Shul... lit the candle, the torch, in 2010, and you will watch now a beautiful, exciting clip. There are some subtitles that we can uh, read. Obrigado. Obrigado. Ana, não chumei. Ilana, e os captores que corriam lhes é more, e chamam, e chamam o som do computador. Le mata. Ali há o microfone. לא, זה לא שם. איפה שאתה משרת את המסך, יש שלוש נקודות שקוראים לזה מור, אז תשימי את הסאונד של הקומפיוטר.
אפשר מתוך ה-share screen, יש למטה אה, ריבוע שבו כתוב אה, sound from the computer, ואז זה עובד. שילנה תקרא את זה בקול. שילנה לא שומעים את הקול. יאללה, אתה שומע אותי? כן. Thank you, uh, sorry we had the, the mute on the, on the uh, clip. Uh, I invite Mr. Bar Shur to light the candle and ask all participants, ask all participants to light their memorial candle in memory of the six million Jews who were perished at the Holocaust. בבקשה, נקסט קליפ, אילנה. ועוד אח קטן. One. I am Baruch Shub, 96 year old, born in Lithuania, chairman of the Partisan and Fighters Organization. Today, 21st of April 2020, this is the first time since 1945 I am alone on the Holocaust Memorial Day because of the Corona virus and that we have to stay home. I'm honored to join Maccabi World Union at this memorial gathering together with my two sons, Yossi and Roni. I feel well and pray we will overcome this period in good hands. I light this memorial candles, candles in memory of my family, family and partisans who fought insanely and prove that we do not go as sheep to the slaughter. Am Israel Chai. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shub. We salute you. We wish you long life. And I would like to invite now his son, Yossi Shub, for his call. Bevakasha, Yossi. Uh, if you hear me, just uh, wave. It's all right, thank you. Uh, so uh, this is our special uh, remembrance. We are separations of Holocaust survivors. We'll remember for eternity and not forget our deceased family members, children, elderly and infants who were murdered in horrible and cruel ways in the extermination camps, concentration camps, killing ravines, ghettos, forests, and hiding places by the Germans and their collaborators. We will remember and preserve the culture and way of life of our family members who perished. We will remember and pass on to future generations as a beacon in a, a, an eternal flame, the last cry of our relatives to remember and not forget. We will remember and fight tirelessly the attempts in the world to renew anti-Semitism, to deny and distort the Holocaust. And we will remember and fight for the right of our parents, grandparents, and other Holocaust survivors to grow older with dignity in the state of Israel and all around the world. Thank you, Yossi. Uh, we'll follow by my colleague, Rabbi Carlos Tapiero, El Malera Hamim in Kaddish. Bevakasha. 
I've been uh, standing since the beginning of the ceremony, and I'm inviting you right now to raise, to stand up, please, where you are. This is in the memory of the six million brothers and sisters brutally murdered in the Shoah. <laughs> Am semenu kane kona al kamfe shina be malot ke doshim teorim ke zora ki amazirim lishmot shisha milyonei achenu bene Israel anashim nashim yeladim bataf halale yashoa shenergo shenishkhatu shenisrefu ve shenispu al kidush Hashem בידי המרצחים הגרמנים הנאצים ועוזריהם נשאר עמיהם. לאחרן בעל הרחמים יסתירם בסדר גנפיו לרמים ליצור בצורכי מתשמותיהם. אדוני נחלתן בגן עדן תה מנוחתם וינדו לגורלם לקץ הימין ונאמר אמן. We will recite Kaddish, those of you can say Kaddish, to recite Kaddish don't open your mics, just say with me, those of you who can say. Yadal v'tkada sheme rabba, v'alma divera chiluteh v'amlich malchuteh, v'chayichon v'yamechon v'chayi dechon v'et Yisrael, v'agala v'zman kari v'imru, amen. Yehe sheme rabba mevarach l'alam al-mel maya, v'itbarach v'ishtabach v'itpahar v'itromam v'itnaseh, v'itadar v'italev v'italal sheme dekudesha, ברכו, למנקור בחטא ושירתה, תושבחתה ונחמתה, דמירם בעלמה ואמרו אמן. אמן. יש לה פרבה ושמעיה וחיים עלינו, ועל כל ישראל ואמרו אמן. אמן. ועל כל ישראל ואמרו אמן. אמן.
Our first testimony by Dr. Margalit Ganor Schmelzer was born in Chernovitz, Bokovina in Romania. Margalit is a psychotherapist. She, the, she is the head of the education department and member of the executive committee of the Roth Institution. And we will hear her testimony. Margalit, Vivakasha. My name is Margalit. I was called Litty for I was very little. Just the baby born. In Chernovitz, Bukovina, Romania, two months before the war broke out. I don't remember anything for the first six years in my life. Psychologists say that even if a child doesn't remember, the body remembers. And I know that I'm scared to death of water. The hairs on my hand stand out when I hear the voice of a chicken. I cannot stand the eyes of cats. I heard this story I'm about to tell you from my parents, never directly, but when I was in bed in the evening, I could hear my father telling the story to people who came to visit him. I don't know how to pack a lifetime story into 10 minutes. So didn't the people know how to pack their whole lives into a little suitcase, but I'll do my best. My father, Dr. Arie Leon Schmelzer, was born in 1894, nicknamed Machiku. He lived in Chernovitz, a beautiful city compared to Vienna in culture and beauty. Very energetic person, medium height, sportive, born to a visionator rabbi. Grew up in a Hasidic strict environment, yet very enlightened. His mother, Regina, loved him very much. He was her little boy always. Local Romanians adored his talents as a lawyer. He was a criminal lawyer. And the Jews adored him for his activities in the community and also as a Zionist active member. He visited Palestine eight times till the year 1938. He was invited as a guest of honor to the opening of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem in 1925. But he always returned to Chernovitz, which he considered his home. He fulfilled his Zionist duties in collecting money for Kern Kayemet Israel and other organizations. In 1938, he finally decided to marry his beautiful secretary, 16 years younger than him, who worked for him for the last 10 years. A year later, I was born. And in 39, everyone knows the war broke out. They understood the opportunity to go to Zion has disappeared. The dream could only remain a dream. In 1940, the war started in Chernovitz. The clock was ticking for them as well, not before, but then. The Russians invaded Romania, and in Chernovitz, they stormed. They did everything they could to distinguish and to, and to kill the Jewish community the rich people of the Jewish community. And then my parents had to flee because both of them were Jewish and both of them were very active Zionist members. So they fled to the wood where a woman who used to bring them eggs and milk hid them 
underneath the cock hen where she kept the, the chicken. They stayed there for six months. I often wonder, how do you stay six months in a chicken hen in the dark with very little food? And my mother once told me that I used to cry all the time. And I said, I want the little pillow of the Baba Yeti. My grandmother made me a little pillow and in the way of children, I went to sleep with this little pillow and in their hurry, they forgot to take this pillow. So she told me she had to smother my mouth so that I won't cry. In 1941, the Germans invaded. The woman came and told my parents, the Germans are coming. My father was so happy. He was ecstatic. Why was that? He was a very decorated officer in the Austrian army in World War I. He was even wounded. So he was sure the Germans, they will have a red carpet for him and he will be a big hero. They left the hiding place, came and they saw the German tanks rolling into the city and the citizens were standing on both sides of the road and throwing candy at them. The next day, the river Prut was full of blood and bodies were floating inside the river. And the Germans appointed the Rom their Romanians as their doers. They would stand for the Germans. Of course, the Romanians were much more cruel than the Germans. And so, my father understood that he has to take action. But what can he do? What can he do? If they stay there with the family, with my grandmother and everyone, they will probably be sent to the camps in um, Transylvania or killed in the street and thrown into the, the graves that they dig for themselves. So what to do? He was lucky. The Romanians, permitted many things the Germans wouldn't. And if you had the little money, even better if you had more, you could do anything. So he decided to buy a boat, a very little boat, because the war was still going on in Europe and there were many mines in the sea. So he decided to buy a very little boat. It was almost the size of a bus, not a London bus a little bus and he sold places to four other families five children five women and five men and all of them were told they cannot take anything with them except a very little suitcase and they could tell no one nobody they will simply disappear from the face of the earth and then my father wrote a letter to his beloved mother, a letter he could never send. And in the letter he wrote, my dearest mamu, I say goodbye to you and no, I will never see you again. I see your wrinkled face in front of me, your carefully combed white hair, your smart and loving eyes. You love me so much. And I repay you by deserting you, old, sick, and lonely. When Liti was born, your granddaughter, you drove in a high carriage for everyone to see her. You will not ride with her in a carriage again, and you will not meet her. She will grow up without the great love of a grandmother. What would I not give for things to be different? I have no alternative. We must escape. I pray that God keeps an eye on you and guards you. I don't think you can forgive me, but still I'm asking for your forgiveness. You know how much we love you. Maybe you can find comfort in the thought that we can raise our child in a land of Jews free of persecution. I love you so much, your little boy, Machiko.
In August 94, quietly, the ship Dora sailed from the coastal city of Braila and entered the open sea. The waves rocked the little ship and everyone was sick. On the second night, a big storm broke out and the ship was stranded on a very big rock and there was a threat of it breaking into two. Where is the captain? shouted my father. Where is he? No answer. He took command. He told every one of the men to make ropes out of anything they could find. Shirts, blankets, and tie the children and women to them and so they will swim out to the sea. He supposed the shore is close because if the ship is stranded on a rock, it must be very close to the shore. And so they swam in the middle of a very dark night with the high waves. Dawn found them stranded on a beach. Nowhere could they see anything. Everyone was hungry, wet, cold. My dear God, prayed my father, please help us, save us. All the souls that I took upon myself, you must help me to save everyone. The day went on. In the distance, they saw a group of soldiers on horsebacks with long guns. As the soldiers surrounded them, one of them, probably the uh, officer in charge, said, who are you? What are you doing here? You're a spy. The war was still going on. It was 1942. My father stood in front of him and tried to explain to this person who spoke a strange language. It was Turkish. He said, we are immigrants. We wanted to go to Palestine. Our ship is stranded. He shows the ship is here in the sea. And he told the people, please go on your knees and show him that you surrender. My father says that I broke the silence when I said, mommy, daddy, a little water. I need water. And this word, the officer understood they gave us a little water and they built a tent for us and left. We were stranded on this beach in this tent for 40 days without water, without food, just a little that the soldiers brought every two days. At night, the shackles, jackals you say? Jackals. The jackals surrounded the tent and Father said, I was uh, murmuring, tata, tata, I'm shakal. We spoke German at home. During the day, everyone was hungry. The sun was beating so strong. A dust storm broke down the tent. And my father was desperate. He prayed to God and he said, you always answered my prayers. No more. You're not looking down at me. We are all lost and we are going to die in this desert here. One Friday, he saw the women taking the children and walking into the sea, trying to kill themselves. No more. They lost all hope. And the men ran after them into the water each of them trying to save his child, trying to save his, his, um, his woman. And nothing helped. They were alone there in this desert. More days passed. Suddenly, a soldier from the guard, whom my father saved from a scorpion, came to my father and explained to him motioning with his hands that they are leaving for Adana. And then he said, post, post, meaning if you want to send a letter, I will take a letter. 
And my father wrote the letter in German to the governor of Adana so that they will have, they will need a translator. And if the soldiers left, they put the letter in a potato. So if he was searched, no one will find the letter. Again, weeks pass, nothing. One day, they see from far off a boat coming, three people getting off the boat. One of them an elegant gentleman saying, I'm the delegate of the governor of Adana. And this here is the rabbi of the Jews of Adana. Tell me about yourselves. They took them in the boat three at a time to the ship that was waiting far out in the sea. And with trembling feet, they mount the ship and my father says to the captain, where are you taking us? Turkey? Palestine? No, he says, Cyprus. It's still the middle of the war. It's still 1942. They took them to Cyprus. They were not, the camps were not up then. And they couldn't go to Palestine because the British government had the white book which had a quota for Jews coming to the land, even if they were such big Zionists as my father. And so they lived in Cyprus for two years. My mother was so sick, she had to be in bed. She froze from the fear. And the doctor said to my father, you'd better say goodbye to her because she's not going to survive. And she, from her bed, told my father, look, we can build a little oven here. And in this oven, they bake cakes, which they sold to the uh, people from Cyprus. And so they lived. We had no toys, no puppets, nothing. But there was only one person, Professor Tzvi Yavitz, later on. Then he was called Harry Zucker. He taught the children Hebrew. He would come under the window and sing, and all the children followed him like the Pied Piper of family. So after two years, finally, we get certificates to go to Israel. And in 1944, March, Purim holiday, a brown bass came to edit Jerusalem. And a woman, a man, and a little child, which was me, came off the bus. And my father always said, we came with a bathing suit on our body. And as a child, I thought, Pouring, it's winter, it's cold. How can we be with a bathing suit? But at that time, children never ask questions of their parents. I wish we had. And so they were here to build a new life. I never heard any complaints at home of what we left over there. My parents were still happy to live the Zionist dream in the land of the, their dreams. And me as a child, I grew up in a home of giving, of, of ideas. My mother used to sing Zionist songs before we went to sleep. And one of these songs was about the land of Zion, the land of our hopes, and now we are there. So this is the story, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, uh, Dr. Margaret Ganor. We were overwhelmed by your uh, story. This is the family of uh, Margaret. This is my father to the right, my grandmother who died there, Regina in the middle, me as a child, and down on the right side, 
uh, you see my other grandmother and my grandfather who knew me as a baby. Thank you. And this is the Zionist dream. Dr. Chaim Weizmann in the middle and near him, the director of the Jewish organization, Zionist organization in Chernovitz. Above them in the middle with a white handkerchief is my father in that historic meeting. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Margalit. We were very moved by your uh, story. So happy that the family made it. And now we are uh, delighted to uh, introduce the second uh, testimony, our dear friend Iris lifshitz Klieger, who is a journalist at the Idiot Achronot newspaper. Iris is the daughter of the late Noach Nobel Klieger, who passed away in December 2018 at the age of 93. Noach was not only a survivor of the Holocaust, but was one of the founders of Maccabi Tel Aviv and Maccabi Ramad Gan, was a dear friend of our movement. Iris, bevakasha. Hello to all of you who were kind to join this special memorial event. I have to admit, at this moment, I was supposed to be in Auschwitz at the March of Life, number 33, but the corona canceled, unfortunately, every event. As a second generation, I am speaking to you as the daughter of my private Auschwitz survivor, Noach Klieger, prisoner number 172-345. To live with the Holocaust survivor means to me to understand, for example, why my father used to finish his cheese box till the end, but till the end. Never ever throwing away food, of course and also understand why he had always crumbs of cake or piece of bread on his pockets. Since I was a child, six years old, I started asking him many questions. I didn't stop. I just ask and ask and ask. Why do you have this number on your you. arm, Daddy? I remember he was looking at my mother, Jacqueline, and trying to find an answer, but to answer to a little child, what? What to say to her? From that moment, he started to tell me his stories and never stopped. That was his mission, traveling all over the world and telling his life story. One unbelievable miracle from the Auschwitz camp was the way he saved himself, his, his life by lying. It was the, not, not the first time he lying in the cab, but this story I want to share with you. He lied that he is a professional boxer just to get more soup. And use my, like my dad used to tell me, you think about soup with vegetables, with nadala, but that was not the soup that we got. It's just some awful hot water, but this was a soup for the survivor, for the prisoner. So he lied. He lied that he is a professional boxer, and they put him in a gym with the biggest professional boxer, uh, Jung Peret. Jung Peret was a really professional boxer. So in this moment, when a child asks her father, so what did you do? You should be some kind of a superhero, someone some that I know from Walt Disney uh, movies. So how did you get with a big boxer name from, a, um, a, he was not a French, he was from Tunis. So this is the miracle that I was 
learning miracle by learning by listening to my father that to survive in ho a Holocaust, a terrible, terrible camp like Auschwitz. I have to say that also my grandfather and also my grandmother uh, sent to this camp and all the three didn't know each other what happened to the family. The, the end of the story of the box, I do it very quickly because there is a, be a nice movie about this that called Boxer of Life that uh, saying all this story. But the things that I took with me and for my children, and I hope for the next, next generation, is the force to understand in our life, even in those, these Corona days, that it's not easy, that my mother is not with me. She's in her house and I'm here in another city in Israel, of course, to keep her. But if my father was here, the first thing that he was telling to us, he will say, Corona, Shmorona, what we were kept in the, in the Holocaust, in the camp, all the awful things, also in Mangale, uh, Dr. Mangale, because my father was also in his hand. So I think we have to get a force and encourage that this bad thing will pass, but, and a real bad. I remember him to say that the most awful things that can be, and when he say this, he didn't dream about this kind of disease of corona. You say this like this, the awful things that should happen is if not even to be in Auschwitz, that we will never for, uh, remember Auschwitz, what happened there. And with this uh, sentence, I'm like a gen next generation. I tried with my articles, with my children, with my stories that he gave me. I tried to get into his shoes. It's a big shoes because this was his mission. But I think what we are doing now in this moment, even if the corona, even I'm not in Auschwitz, uh, march of life that I want to be there and with a lot of young people. Even all the events in Israel are cancelled and also in Europe and America. I will share with you a, a small story about the young girl, the little girl of me, that used to take before I'm going to sleep to remember that my father was, of course, a survivor of a terrible camp and also survivor of the March of Death. And also a guy who was in a team of brothers ship that came to Israel with all the Zionists that wants to be in Israel. And also a very, very sportive guy that likes sports, writes about sports, and uh, used to have the, uh, the, first, the first one in Israel of a uh, chairman of Tel Aviv uh, basketball, and then Maccabi Ramadan basketball team. And why I tell you this about his uh, own uh, love to uh, sport, the first thing is that my father, I will share it a secret with you because today I published this in my article after my dad is not in life anymore. He died last year, year and a half. He never tell this because it, 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 it was very difficult to admit that he never wants to return back to Auschwitz on 90... 1945, when the, when the war finished, he wants his life back. He wants to be happy. He wants to be with young people, with healthy people, to eat well, to have a family, to come to Israel, to be a soldier here. And, of course, 
to write about sports, not about a Holocaust subject. And he was a, a reporter of sport in Yediot Akonot in 1959. But in this, in July 59, uh, he's the editor of the newspaper, the biggest one in Israel, Yediot Akonot. He was also an Holocaust survivor. The name was David Kofsky. He sent him to uh, write about a basket, uh, a play of football of uh, Israeli team. And when they arrived to Poland, the consul that worked there in those times asked him, no, you know, in next to a couple hours from Varsha, uh, we can drive to a museum that's called Museum of Auschwitz. The first thing my father uh, told him, he said, you are crazy. I ran away from this uh, awful and uh, terrible things. I don't want it. He was afraid. But his boss, the editor, not uh, mobile, not SMS, just in telephone, normal telephone, told him, you must do this because this is the first time that an Israeli arrives to this area you will go to this museum in Poland and you will tell us in Israel what is the meaning of this museum. So after 14 years that he survived from Auschwitz, he returned back to this camp, he returned to this museum and the things that he told me when I remember that he returned back, he was shocked. I, I was not born yet. I have to admit, it was 59, I born in 65, but when I start asking, asking questions, one of the stories was this one that he will never, he told me I will never explain this to my audience because then I cannot explain Holocaust, what happened there. What happened is that the editor asked him, no, what happened in this museum? Could, could you tell this to the, to your article, a nice article, and he said, listen carefully. What, I'm, what I saw there, this is terrible, this is not Auschwitz that we are the survivors, we are the, the, the murders that murdered there. He saw a couple sitting on a chair in, in outside with a uh, sandwich, making a picnic, in a nice day in uh, July with sunshine. And he said, this was not a picnic museum of Auschwitz. And I should take to my, to my heart, even if it's too hard for me to say what's really happened there. And from this, from this moment on 59, he never stopped to talk, never. Every school, every, companies, every soldier in Israel, outside the countries, Jewish, not Jewish, everyone that gave him to tell stories that will never, never forget. Before I finish my little um, story about him, because I can speak about him weeks, most of the things I remember from my hero, my private hero, it's the smiling, it's the surviving to, to have a good life, to do things for good people, for, for, for good, to do good things for people, and always to remember that he was brave and we won. When he had a family, when he had me, when he had his grandchildren, for him it was the victim, and every time when he came back to Mitzad Chaim to the March of Life. He said, if I can come to this camp and return back to my lovely country, my lovely Israel, so this is victory. And I have to say that his mother, his father, the three pieces of a part of a, a family, Three of them were in Auschwitz. The, my grandmother was in Birkenau. My grandfather Bernard was an, a, a very uh, famous uh, 
a writer, he was the guy that should write the names of the, of the prisoner every day to remark the prison that died. And every day in this a lot of months, he saw it, the name of his son that survived until the last day before they go to the marsh of death. The meeting of these three guys of my family was in, by, by mistake. My father saw that the parents are not survived at their murder. He returned back after the war to Belgium, to Brussels. He drew, go to a tram number five, and while sitting, couple, young couple, very, um, not, uh, you know, they don't, they will not be fed after the Holocaust, very thin. He didn't recognize his father because his father was usually very, very fat. And his mother said, hey, Mr. Klieger, you are not our son, you are not my, my Klieger. So this is a happy end when you listen in Shoah, all the stories that are very bad, bad, bad stories. But for me, for a child, for the next generation, I know to say the bad stories to, to tell the other generation. But I remember another thing. Three years before, he was standing on the UN International uh, Holocaust Day with my son, with Yuval, that was with, uh, he was, he is a, a Navy, a soldier in the Navy. The first time that a Navy, a soldier from Israel, uh, came to the UN in New York, standing next to a witness from Holocaust in a uniform because they didn't permit it. But my father said, if this soldier will not come with me to the stage with his uniform, so I'm not going to the stage to speak my, my speech, to say my speech. And that was the story. He was on the stage with his son, with his grandfather, uh, grandchild in a, soldier, in a uniform, and he said this thing. Thank I'm you. afraid that we are the last witnesses from the Holocaust, that after we died, nobody wants to continue to speak about Holocaust. So it's a few years and Holocaust will not remember. And this was very worried him, also the antisemitic that every day grew up and I stay here now with a lot of proud and with a smile that he teaches me to smile even after a cancer and I, I'm healthy now. But the force that I get from my hero, from my superhero, it's to smile, to have our country, to believe that the boxer that he has in his hands can be used for each of you to believe the things that I want to finish my words. Thank you. Dear Father, we will never forget, not you and not all the Holocaust. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Iris. The story of your father is the story of Maccabi World Union. We went for Holocaust to independence. We grew through the sports and Maccabi became the largest organization ever in the world. Thank you, Iris. Now I'm delighted to uh, present our speaker, former chief commander of the Israeli Air Force, general in reserve, Idon Echustan, Bevakasha. Thank you, Eyal. Thank you all. I'm delighted to uh, share with you a story that I believe is some kind of a uh, unique. If if I Eyal, if I uh, Eyal, uh, can just share the presentation, if you can allow me, because I'm not allowed right now. 
I don't know how. Yes. A second. Okay. Okay. This is fine. A minute. Can you have that? No. Though so it's easier to fly F sixteen. <laughs> yeah, certainly it flies better than uh... <laughs> <laughs> How how can you? Uh, I just want to share the the desktop. How do you do that? If you press share screen, you should have your desktop. Okay. Yeah, that's what I have. And then you have some. Do you have it now? Do you see anything? No. When you hover your cursor at the bottom of the screen there, there's an option in the middle that says share screen and then normally you can choose which tab you would like to share. It's the green button. Yeah, yeah I have it. Share. Content, you have screen, but nothing goes. Then. Maybe Ilana should unfreeze the option. I did. All right. Here is. Here is. Share sc screen, but uh, then it goes to something uh, unfamiliar. Maybe Iris should go out from the. Screen recording as a child. Do you have anything? Yeah. Yes. We got yeah, it. we have it. We have so, it. The you. story of the IF. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for the delay, the technical delay. My name is Idwana Fustan. I served as a fighter pilot in the Israeli Air Force for 37 years. Between the years 2008-2012, I served as the 16th commander of the Israeli Air Force. I was born in Jerusalem as a child. Uh, certainly a sense of uh, threat of existence to the young Jewish state was in the air. Kids can feel that. But uh, I felt safe. The Holocaust, however, was a dark cloud hovering over the, over the horizon, but not uh, the talk of the day in those days. It was too overwhelming for kids to absorb. Uh, I was 10 years old when the Six Day War broke up in 1967. You can make the calculation. And I was living close to the front line, so I saw the Israeli Air Force in all its might. The agile silhouette of jet slicing the sky, the breathtaking thunder. It was all power, security, and victory. So it became a dream of mine, as many of my age, to become one of them in the air, up there. 10 years after, my dream came, came true. Yossi Shuv, you heard him before, was an admired flight instructor in the flight school at the time. He had a part in that as well. I became a fighter pilot holding in my hands this ultimate fighting machine and began a long, unexpected, in my terms, a career in the Air Force, as I mentioned. 
17 years ago, when I was a Brigadier General heading the air operations for the Air Force, we received an invitation from the Polish Air Force to participate in its 85th anniversary. This was the beginning of the story of the flyover Auschwitz. It was set to be on the 4th of September, 2003. So I'll take you 60 years back to the date, September 4th, 1943. We looked into it and at that very day, a transport of 1,000 people arrived on the camp, 66, 66, 606, one of them were sent to their deaths upon arrival. They all came from Drancy, a small town northeast of Paris. It was also the name of the detainee camp for Jews in France, in which they were sent to labor and extermination camps. They would never know that exactly 60 years after the time of the, of the flyover, names of some of them will be read in a special ceremony that will be conducted by Jewish officers at the very place in which they were killed. They could never have believed that at the same time, their life story articulated in a special document called a page of testimony, you all know that, will be carried inside three mighty flying machines called F-15s with a white star of David emblem on their wings tucked in the jisut of pilots of their own people that serve in the Air Force of the Jewish state. So yes, this is exactly what we decided to do, to commemorate them and read their name and carry the pages of testimony in the airplanes for everybody should have a name and everybody should be remembered. Sixty days to go on the flyover, yeah. and uh, the Israeli Air Force, being highly respected, <laughs> receives many invitations to participate in international events. Only few are granted. Uh, the thought of uh, flying in Polish skies, however, was something we never done before and never done since, mm. immediately ignited the idea for a different flight, one that was never done before. So, of course, he replied yes. Three F-15 jets will represent the State of Israel in the celebration in the base of Radun, Polish Air Base. Base 8 of ours is selected for the mission. And considering the unique opportunity, we also organized a delegation of 200 officers from the IDF called Witnesses in Uniform that will walk through the trail of death in Poland and hold a special ceremony in Auschwitz. I will be heading this delegation, as I had by no chance. A, a survivor for, uh, of, uh, of Auschwitz, is Hakko in his name, from Saloniki, and four bereaved families will join us. But we were looking for something unique for this special delegation, something that will connect air power, the Jewish people, and the Holocaust. So we found Al Weber. Al was a Jewish United States Air Force aviator from Florida. He was, was he's in the 90s at the time. He was a World War II veteran that took part in the operational missions over the skies of Europe. He was shot down twice at the very same time that we're talking about. We, we made contact with Al. He and his wife will join us to the ceremony as well. So now, the setup is clear. Israeli Air Force jets flying over a special memorial ceremony held in Auschwitz by a special delegation of 200 IDF officers. But did, will that be possible? Still, days to go. Six days to go and the Polish Air Force uh, celebration is taking place in Radom Air Force Base. There is high interest in the Israeli team. The booth is a great success. My delegation of the witnesses in uniform is on the way to Poland, but the special flyover we planned is facing difficulties. You cannot fly tools of war 
over the death camp, says the local Polish governor. This is a holy place. These were his words. Shevach Weiss, our ambassador to Poland and the survivor himself, argues, he argued to the Poles. These are not tools of war, but a symbol. This is not a demonstration of power, but it's a, a salute to our dead. The pilots, he said, are the sons and grandsons of the victims. They fly wearing uniform of the Jewish army over the ashes of their people and families, calling their names and shedding a tear. And so it was. Six hours, six hours to go, and we are still at the hotel in Krakow, heading for Auschwitz-Birkenau. My pilot's instincts drive me to look in the sky and analyze the weather. It was cloudy, it was rainy, not very good. How will they find the location? Could they cross the clouds downward? Because otherwise, it wouldn't be a flyover. Last evening was very dramatic. Tzchak Cohen, you can see him on the left, the Jewish survivor of Sol Saloniki and Al Weber first met, an American Jewish aviator from Florida, first met, and they were raising memories and sharing their stories with the young officers from the IDF. Al's words to us still echo. We didn't know then, but we know now. Never again, and this is your job to make sure of that. We marched quietly into the camp, the biggest graveyard in the world, not a single tombstone. It's cold outside and freezing in our hearts. Shevach Weiss is saying that this is the most horrible place on earth. We can feel it in the air and in every step. The ceremony is ready and the expectations of the flyover are skyrocketing literally. The time is set for 12.15 and the ground control unit, which we had with us, is ready for the last minute coordination with the planes. In Radom, our guys are getting ready. This is also their flight back home. So they will take off, fly over and continue straight back home. It's a long day. Everybody is tense. Will there be a flyover? It was not obvious. Of course I'm saying, but deep inside, I'm not that sure. The poles and the weather are not with us for the time being. The ceremony is going on as planned. The flyover should be exactly at the end of my speech. We're now 60, day, 60 seconds to go. We're standing at the end of the tracks between crematoria two and three. Two buildings, not very big, yet the most lethal killing facility ever built. I cannot help thinking if only we were there then, back at that time. They would be down in seconds. My speech is over, I turn east towards the famous gate. They should be coming from there along the tracks. Now it's a matter of seconds. I'm looking up in the sky, hoping, clouds, silence, I know the guys, they will never give up and they will be there on time. And then the agile silhouette with the breathtaking thunder slices the sky, perfectly aligned right in front of us. What a contrast between this might and the total helplessness 60 years ago. I still a glimpse to Itzhak, Shevach, Al, the buried families, I see the ceremony in perfect formation. Around us is a cloud of youngsters, not a dry eye in the, in the crowd. Yes, this time the Israeli Air Force came in place on time, but 60 years too late. And when you stand there at the chilling place, it becomes crystal clear, we can't be late ever again. The epilogue. Five years later, I was privileged to become the commander of the chief, commander in chief of the Air Force. It was then that I, when I felt the full extent of this historic responsibility. 
Yitzhak, Yitzhak Cohen continued to escort IDF delegations to Auschwitz. He turned 98, he's still with us in Jerusalem. Al Weber remained in close touch with the Air Force and came to Israel once to attend, to attend the Israel Air Force Memorial Service in Memorial Day. And on my last day of command, his daughter awarded me with his original fly jacket. It was his wish that I have this jacket and the jacket was put on display in the center of heritage of the Air Force. Uh, it serves as a perfect reminder to the unique story symbolizing the, the, the special bond of our people and emphasizing the role of the Israeli Air Force as the air power of the Jewish people as a whole. A few days after the jacket was put in display, El passed away uh, at his home in Florida. It was 10 years after the flyover and exactly to the day, 59 years after his last mission of a viewer. And the Israeli Air Force, folks, it continues to slide the skies even these days today, day and night to spearhead to the fine Israeli Defense Forces, the guardian eye of Zion, forever committed and ensure never again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ido. We salute you. You represent the state of Israel in the best way. We are very proud. We will go over now to the um, Eagles over Auschwitz. Ilana, bevakasha. For the Jewish people, the 20th century marked both miraculous triumph and unimaginable tragedy. Six million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. And then, within just a few years, a Jewish state was reborn in the land of Israel. Today, the existence of a strong state of Israel ensures that never again truly means never again. Thursday, August 28th, 2003, an Air Force base in central Israel, the F-15 Eagle. Levko, his grandfather was a pilot in the Austro-Hungarian Air Force during World War I. This saved his father's family in Budapest during the Holocaust. Shim Shon, a reserve pilot, he was named after an uncle that was murdered in the Lodge Ghetto. Brigadier General Amir Eschel the commander of the Air Force Base and the flyover mission. 11.50 a.m. Takeoff of the three F-15s. The pilots begin their journey. Their mission, a flyover during a commemorative ceremony at Auschwitz. They will demonstrate that Hitler failed, that a strong and thriving Jewish state has risen a state with a powerful army that safeguards all of the world's Jews, translating the words never again into action. In 1943, 1,000 Jews arrived in the 59th SS transport from Drancy, France. Following the selection, 232 men and 106 women were admitted to the camp. The other 662 people were murdered in the gas chamber. Sixty years later, members of the Israel Defense Forces returned to this hallowed ground where more than one million Jews were murdered. Brigadier General Ido Nehishtan leads a special remembrance ceremony attended by officers from all branches of the IDF. In paying tribute to the dead, they send a powerful message about their sacred commitment to protecting the Jewish people.
הקולקטיבי. באנו לומר לקורבנות ההשפלה וההשמדה שאפרם מונח כאן לרגלינו, לאלה שהומתו מיד עם הגעת הטרנספורט ולאלה שקודם למותם נטרפה דעתם מעוצמת הרעב, הקור, ההשפלה וההתמודדות היומית עם שפל מנהג אדם באדם. אנחנו כאן, למרות הכל. ההתנגדות היהודית הפכה לצבא מודרני ועל עוצמה אדירה. רוח הקרב שלכם חיה ומפעמת בו. מזדר וצדם. אמיר אתה על מיוט. עכשיו, היה בסדר אמיר, אתה רואה? זהו חברים. I would like first of all to thank those who help us uh, to uh, come out with this event and especially Yossi Shur. It's a great assistant you got from you, Yossi, and uh, we know you do it from all your heart. I don't want to uh, tell you guys uh, my age, but uh, I know Yossi for 60 years, and Roni as well, and the Borka, Baruch, this wonderful Shuv uh, family, and thanks God, uh, Borka is still with us. I would like to say two more things. Number one, with us, representatives from uh, almost or probably all suffered countries from Corona, from Italy, from Spain, from a United States, uh, from Germany, from Holland and other places. So, חברים, please take care of yourself and your community. There are great things that are done. This is not the time uh, to tell about it, but we will do. The last thing that I would like to say before uh, uh, Atikva, symbolically speaking, uh, effective yesterday night, as you know, uh, it seems like we are going to have a government in Israel, a unity uh, government that has to deal with the crucial uh, uh, times we are in, Corona and the effects of Corona, especially economy, the situation here, like in other places in the world, is far away from being great. We have to be a very a, a decisive courage a, to do the things in the right way. A, hopefully, with the new government, we'll know how to do it better. A, the Maccabi friend, without getting into politics, a, Benny, I spoke with him this morning. He knows that we are meeting you guys, and he say a, shalom and thanks for, you know, international support in Israel. So, תודה רבה, and the I believe we are ready for התקווה. 
We are ready for a tikva. Before end, I want to uh, thank my uh, colleagues, David Kornfeld, Ilana, Carlos, of course, Amir, who is on top of things every time, Yossi and Roni and Baruch, Margalit and Iris, and especially Ido. Uh, I had tears in my eyes, so uh, we'll invite you to the next Congress of Maccabi World Union. Probably you have a lot more to say. Thank you, and Atikva, Bevakasha. Kol hot baleva Benima Thank you, everybody. Thank you, man. 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 Thank you, man.